Happy Mother's Day weekend, Sandals Church. <laughs> Want to say hi to all of our moms, man. We love you. We thank you. We wouldn't be here literally without you. So thank you so much. Hey, moms, we're in the best series ever for Mother's Day. You can learn how to understand those crazy kids you had or that crazy man you married or whoever it is in your life or maybe even understand yourself. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing series. I love what God is doing. And the Bible says that we are to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And I think loving ourselves is probably the hardest thing we do. Understanding that we're not just a total mess, but there's actually beautiful things in our lives that reflect the glory of God. And that's what I wanna say to you is, for so many of us, we're so focused on what's wrong in our life, we're not listening to God and what he has to say about what's right. And so there's some beautiful things, even moms, about your parenting, even about your kids, there are some things that are right and reflect the glory of God. So let's begin with a word of prayer and ask God to bless our minds as we talk about the observer who lives in their mind. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would speak to us. First and foremost, God, I want every person to hear that they are loved by you, that they are not a mistake, that they were not an accident. God, that you knew them before they were ever born. God, and you love them, and you believe that they are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus, you would not only speak to our minds today, but you would speak to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I gotta warn you, I'm a little bit nervous as to how long the sermon's gonna take. Usually, I kinda, I kinda have an idea of, of how long it's gonna go. I have no idea. So. You know, if it feels long, just sit there. What else are you gonna do? Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna talk about one of the most famous stories. Even if you've never been to church, you've probably seen the verse at a football game uh, or a basketball game or a baseball game, John 3, 16. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. An amazing, amazing verse that takes place at night in a conversation between a brilliant man and the only person who can save mankind, Jesus Christ. I believe that Nicodemus is an observer. And so just know, for the last three weeks, we've been in the heart section of the Enneagram. The twos, the threes, the fours, right? Their underlying issue is how do I feel? How do I feel? And for the two, that's based upon serving. For the three, that's achieving. And for the four, it's just about feeling. Do I feel like I'm making a difference? Do I feel like I'm deep? Do I feel like I have depth? Do I feel creative? This is the biggest shift. So write this in your notes. This is the biggest shift in the Enneagram. So if you're four and you're married to a five and you feel separate at times, there's a reason for that because there's a gigantic gap. Now don't be discouraged, because oftentimes fours and fives fall in love. Why? Opposites attract, right? And then you drive yourself crazy for the rest of your life. But there, there's something about that. So the four feels deeply, feels more than any other in the heart triad, and we're gonna shift to the five, who does not live their life based upon their heart, but their head. We are now entering into the head section where literally the five, the six, the seven, they're in their minds. They're thinking about the world and they're processing everything up here. And so just know that if you're a four and you're married to a five, you're gonna be talking about how you feel and the five is gonna be talking about, this is how I think. And oftentimes that creates a gap that feels like it's insurmountable, like you can't connect. But, but, but don't believe that because it's amaz amazing. And Jesus Christ is gonna try to get Nicodemus, some of you've never read it this way, out of his head and into his heart. And that's where born again comes from. Nicodemus, you cannot think your way into heaven. Unless you're born again, you will never experience the life that God has for you. So listen to me if you're a five, God has given you a beautiful mind, an amazing mind. You're a deep thinker, you are an observer and we love you and appreciate you, but you have to get in contact with your heart because despite what you think, listen to me if you're a five, you do have emotions, you do have feelings. And how do we know that? Because in fives who are scientists tell us no human being, wait for it fours, you're gonna love this, no human being ever makes a decision without emotion. You just can't see it in the five, but it's there, it's there. So fives, trust me, it's there, the observer, it's there. You're not Spock, okay, you're not. You have a heart, you do, and it's there. And you are operating that, you need to get in touch with that, okay? So there was a man named Nicodemus. 
a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Now, this sentence really doesn't help us out here because really in the Greek, what it's doing is it's kind of listing like if you had a guest speaker at a college. This person is a PhD. They did this. They did that. Here's all their awards. They won the Nobel Peace Prize. Literally, the story begins with this just incredible entry of one of the most amazingly intelligent men on earth at the time. His name is Nicodemus, and he's world-renowned for his intelligence. He's absolutely brilliant. He is a mind above almost every other mind. So his name is Nicodemus. He's a Jewish religious leader, but he's not just a leader. He is a Pharisee, and he's one of the leading Pharisees. And wait for it. For those of you who don't know your Bible history, he's also a part of the Sanhedrin. You say, well, what does that mean? Imagine an American citizen who's a member of the Senate and the Supreme Court at the same time. I don't even know if that's constitutionally possible. I'm not a constitutional scholar. So don't send me an email. I'm just saying it would be like that. So he's a senator and a Supreme Court justice. He does both. He is a very, very powerful person, and he is brilliant. After a dark evening, one dark evening, and I want you to circle that word, because remember when you read the Gospel of John, light never means the light's on, and dark never means it's dark. He's speaking metaphorically. This is a dark time in Israel's history, and one of the greatest minds of the Jews is missing out on who Jesus is. And let me say this, if you're an observer, you cannot think your way into heaven, and many of you will miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the distance from your brain to your heart. Depending on your height, right? Because some of the fives are gonna be like, well, my height is actually 5.11. Okay, 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 smart guy, back off. I don't know the exact distance between your brain and your heart, but you get it. I need you to connect with your heart. He came to speak with Jesus. Now circle this word. So here's one of the most educated individuals and accomplished leaders in Israel's history, and he refers to Jesus as what? Pharisee, excuse me, as rabbi. He acknowledges Jesus's brilliance. He said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. What does the observer do? The observer watches the world we live in. They make observations and they note them. We have a word for that nowadays. It's called a scientist, right? They observe, they take notes. He says, it's obvious your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. It doesn't take a genius to see someone raise someone from the dead and you say, well, you're kind of special. Like hopefully, if I raise somebody from the dead, you're gonna go, you know that Matt Brown, he's special. He's special, okay? He says, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So here he is, he's making observations, he's looking at the world as he understands it, and Jesus says you can't observe your way into heaven. And this is why so many intellectuals don't come to faith in Christ. You can be a professor of New Testament. You can teach students about Christianity and miss Jesus. My first class in college, I took New Testament. Not my first class, my first semester. Took New Testament. I'll never forget, the professor wrote on the board, Satan is not real. And I went, idiot. And everybody in class is taking notes. I'm like, why are you guys taking notes? This guy's an idiot. He could tell, you know, based upon my face and my inability to hide my three, right? He says, you have a different opinion? I said, no, but Jesus did. So I'm gonna go with Jesus. Yeah, I didn't do too well in that class, but you know, I got through it. So a lot of intellectuals know a lot about the Bible and they know nothing about God. Let me say that again, because you missed it. A lot of intellectuals know a lot about the Bible and they know nothing about God. Because you can't wrap your mind around God. Your brain ain't big enough. And I did say ain't, write it down, it's gonna kill you. He says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Something has to happen dramatically in you. There has to be a real change for you to get into heaven. You can't think your way, you can't earn your way, and you can't buy your way. And what does he say? What an observer says. What do you mean? I have a question, exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? 
He knows that's impossible. You won't fit. What's funnier than that? You can laugh. It's kind of awkward, but you can laugh. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What's he talking about? What happens right before you're born? Anybody ever experienced that? Okay, we've all experienced that. You just don't remember it. But I can tell you, because I was there for my first child's birth, Tammy felt birth pain. She says, it's time to go to the hospital. We panicked. We went there. We went to Kaiser. They said, nope, baby's not cooked yet. You need to go home. So we were frustrated, and Tammy was hungry, so we went to Coco's. We went to Coco's. Tammy said, I need to get up to go to the bathroom, and said, oh, it happened. Well, she didn't go to the bathroom. Do you know what happened? Her water broke. And let me just tell you this, young men, it's not a little water. <laughs> Note to self, it is, not, it is not a small amount of water. I had to add a few dollars to our tip and apologize profusely to the management and all the other people eating dinner as my wife is leaking all across the carpet as we try to get her out. And she didn't stop leaking when we left the restaurant. We got into her sister's van and she, be, I mean, she was like a hose. So when you're born, the water breaks and then guess what happens? You come out, you come into the world. Listen to me, unless the spirit is involved in your conversion, you haven't been born again. It doesn't matter if you walk forward at a harvest crusade or you get baptized at sandals. Without the spirit, you just took a walk or you just got wet, but you are not saved. You need something to happen. Something actually has to happen. There's an interaction between you and God where new life begins. He says humans can rep reproduce only human life, but the spirit gives birth to spiritual life, to spiritual life. There's only one person that can get you to God. Today I noticed for the first time, I've driven by this place literally for the last 20 years I've been the pastor in, in here in Riverside. And for 20 years the sign has said palm reader. And they changed their sign and I noticed it. I'm a noticer, I notice everything, I have ADD. They changed it from palm reader to spiritual guide. Some of you notice that. Spiritual guide, let me tell you something, be very, very careful about who you choose for a spiritual guide. Because if you choose the wrong one, they will not lead you to heaven, but straight to hell. Be very, very careful who you believe. And so I want you to notice here, Nicodemus is supposed to be the spiritual guide. Write in your notes, he's the best we got. He's the best, he's the smartest. He can write Hebrew forward and backwards. He knows Greek, he can speak Aramaic. He is brilliant beyond brilliant and he's missing it. Jesus says the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life, so don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. He says the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't circle this word if you're a five, an observer. You can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What does that mean? And it's so sad as Christians, we argue over how people are saved. Jesus just said, don't, because you're never gonna fully understand it. I don't care what the commentary says. There is some interaction between God and us that produces life. And churches fight over what's God's part and what's your part, and we miss out on the experience of the Spirit. How are these things possible? What is Nicodemus doing? He's still observing, he's still detached, he's still watching. Jesus replied, you are a respected teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. College students, there are some things your professors, wait for it, don't know. Not enough laughter. Too many years since many of you have been in college, right? There's some things they don't know. How is it that you're the best we've got? You're Israel's genius, and you're clueless as to what I'm talking about. He says, I assure you, and we tell you what we know and have seen, and you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? 
No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come from where? Down from heaven. Why is Jesus a reliable guide? Because he's taking you to where he's from. Everybody else is just guessing. He's a reliable guide. He says, how can you possibly believe when I tell you about heavenly things? No one's ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but live forever. That's the gospel. How do you get there from here? It's a heart issue. You can't think your way. Observers are amazing. They're incredible. Oftentimes, they're geniuses. The observer reflects, write this down, God's wisdom. God's wisdom. Look, the reality is they're probably smarter than the rest of us. Just accept it. Just own it. It's okay. It's okay. If you're a five, I'm dumber than you but I'm still on stage because I'm a three. <laughs> and if you're a five, you go, that's what I've observed. And I'm wondering why you are on stage. So let's talk about the basic motivation. What drives the observer? They want to gain knowledge. Why is Nicodemus talking to Jesus? Because he can't wrap his mind around him. And who can? Who can? Who steals a lunch from a little boy and feeds 5,000 people? Who does that? Jesus. It doesn't make any sense. Who walks on water? Try it. That's my favorite thing, watching people on Instagram trying to, to do it. No one does it. They all fall into the water. It's hilarious. They're trying to gain knowledge. They're trying to understand. Man, if you're raising a little five, guess what their favorite question is going to be? Why? 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 You're like, oh my gosh, he's four and smarter than all of us. You're raising a little Einstein. Just get out of the way and watch him go. They want to gain knowledge. They want to know why. The rest of us are like, we don't, we don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care how the plane works. I just want it to work. Right? By the way, fives make great pilots. Great pilots. You want a five at the wheel when that thing ain't working. And we'll talk about why. They want to gain knowledge. They want to know. They want to know. They ask big questions. Why are things this way? And it's that question why that led to seminaries, which led to universities, which led to science. It's one of the saddest things in modern day is we give Christianity no questions, or excuse me, no credit, but the reality is it was great Christians who asked great questions that led to our great schools, that transformed human life. They wanted to know, why do things work the way they do? Next, they want to uncover truth. Okay, don't ever take a five to a magic show. Oh, I know how he did it. I know exactly how he did it. Shut up. I want to believe. I love taking my wife to magic shows because she like thinks the guy's Jesus. <gasps> but it makes me a little uncomfortable because my wife's cute and the magicians always notice that. I'm like, hey buddy, I'm gonna make you disappear. But they want to uncover truth. Great detectives, right? How did this happen? How do I figure out who committed the crime? They're fantastic. What do they want to avoid? Just absolutely, at all costs, they must avoid incompetence. You want to throw a five off? Pop quiz! They're going to pop you. They want to be ready. They want to be prepared. They want to know when the test is, when the paper's due, and you had better stick to the syllabus. They want to avoid incompetence. Let me say this, don't ever embarrass a five. They don't like it. You want them to come out of their shell? Don't embarrass them. Don't do it, they, they, they don't want that. What will happen is they will retreat further and further back. And here's the thing is, 
observers, fives, they almost know everything. So guess what the rest of us are trying to do? Find when they're wrong. <laughs> you don't know everything. Right? They're never coming over game night at your house. They didn't want to come in the first place. So when healthy, when an observer's healthy, here's the beauty. They remain calm and focused in decisions and processing. That's why you want a five flying the plane. Both engines have gone bad. You don't want me. I'm going, we're going to die. We're going to die. Five is like, we lost engine one. We lost engine two. Tower, we're going to need an emergency landing. We're going to be descending at a speed of 30,000 feet per second. I'm going to need you to have ambulance and fire engines ready as we land. Right, you ever listen, listen to Captain Sully? You ever listen to that? I'll be free, we're dying! What, do you remember what he said? You're gonna find us in the Hudson. <laughs> what? <laughs> Emergency room doctors, you want them to be fives. Wow, you've lost a left leg a right arm, and one ear. If that's a four in there, it's like, oh my gosh, you must be hurting so bad, you're gonna die, oh my God. <laughs> right? A three, I'm not operating, this guy's dead. This is not going on my record. The one, you know you shouldn't have done that, yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't. That's why we wear helmets. That was funny. <laughs> they remain calm and focused, right? They're great, they're fantastic. They're incredible. They can remain unemotional. So like when your small group's ready to kill each other, the five's like, I think we have a problem. <laughs> you know, fours are choking each other out. Threes are looking for group open. I'll stop with that humor, we'll move on. Okay. <laughs> Okay, if you're a four and you're married to a five, here's why you fell in love with them. Because they're very thoughtful. Because they think a lot. They're very thoughtful. And their knowledge is in multiple areas and it makes them incredibly perceptive. See, if you're a four and you're married to a five, the reason you fell in love with them is they can observe your uniqueness and they like it. You're different and I love that about you. It's beautiful. They can listen well. They can repeat back to how you feel, what you're thinking, what happened in your life. Next, when healthy, they're insightful and observant, desiring for the world to be less chaotic and more organized. When a plane crashes, who do you want? Fives, what went wrong? I don't know, but please figure it out because I'm freaking out. Got a lot of four. They're insightful, they're observant. Here's the shift when they become unhealthy. And just so you know, we're all unhealthy. They shift from being observant to detached. So if you're raising a kid and you think they're a five, you really, really gotta watch video games, computers, and even books because your child will disappear. Because books and computers, think they make sense. People don't. People are erratic and weird and bizarre, and they can retreat deeper into themselves, into their head. And you've got to make sure that you love them and care for them, but you call them out and say, we need you to be with us, even if it's for five minutes, because they want to eat their meal in their room. And they don't understand why you guys want to interact while you eat, it's inefficient. You can't read while you do that. Next. A five, when unhealthy, does not engage emotionally or socially in healthy ways. Okay? So when you're a five, you'll go to the party, stand in the corner, watch everyone. But when you become unhealthy, you're not going. You're not gonna go anywhere. And you retreat into yourself. So the observer needs to avoid incompetence 
Why is Nicodemus there? Because he doesn't get it. I don't understand Jesus, why I don't see what everyone else is seeing. Can you explain that to me? They need to avoid incompetence because it can cause them to withdraw completely from the world around them. Have you noticed people are incompetent? No laughter? You, have, you don't get out much. You, don't, you do not get out much. One of my favorite conversations ever was at a fast food restaurant where I was trying to order a medium milkshake. She said, what would you like, sir? I said, I would like a medium milkshake. She said, I'm sorry, sir, they don't come in medium. Oh, she says, yes, we only have one size. I said, just out of curiosity, what size cup would that one size milkshake come in? Uh, it would be a medium, sir. <laughs> Just give me the milkshake. <laughs> that really happened. That's a true story. Okay. You're gonna, you might have to work on this if you're an observer because you're not going to like your course sin, which who likes theirs? Envy, liar, anger, right? Pride. So just know they all stink. Okay, your core sin is greed. Ooh, that sits well. What do I mean by that? Write this down, stinginess. See, what the, what the five does is they withhold. They withhold. What do they hold? First and foremost, their time. So don't waste it. They withhold their time. They're gonna spend time with you, right? So if you're a dad or a mom and you're a five, you don't have time for the kids. You're providing for their life. And you need time to study, time to grow, time to, time to learn, and you retreat to yourself so you don't share time. You're greedy with your time. If you're a five, you're gonna have a really hard time serving at the church. It's gonna be hard for you. It's gonna be difficult for you to volunteer. Why? You're gonna be surrounded by incompetence. It's sandals. <laughs> Next, man, if you love someone that's a five, they're gonna be greedy or stingy with their emotions. They hold it in. They do have a heart, it does beat. But sharing that stuff is scary. And oftentimes, if you love this person, it's like loving them and they're on the other side of the glass. And so they let you in slowly. So if you're five, you, you have to be generous with your time and generous with your emotions. You have to share them. Right? I love you. You can't say, well, I said it once, eight years ago. That should be sufficient. That's not sufficient. Continue to share that. Next, with your knowledge. Did you know that fives actually have a hard time sharing what they know? Because it's precious to them. It's something they've learned. It's something they've attained. And let me tell you something. If you are an observer, you make a great teacher, a great professor, because you can make us all better. You can share what you know. You can share what you've learned. Especially if you're a Christian, you can teach people about God because you understand how it works together because you've studied it. Let me just say this, if you're a five, what good is studying the Bible from front to back if you never share it with anyone? It's not just for you. It's meant to be shared. Next, money. Right, you earned it, you hold it. Oftentimes, observers, fives are great savers. They're stingy with it. Right, you calculate the tithe, not the tithe or the tithe or your tip or whatever it is, you have a hard time just being generous and just blessing somebody with something. You've got to learn to be generous. A healthy five, the observer is always, circle that word, always, this never ends, it never stops. I don't know if you guys realize this, but growth doesn't stop till you die. Till you die, that's when God's done with you. The day you die, you're in heaven, you can stop growing. 
God's going to transform you. God's going to change you. God's going to complete you. But until that time, you got to keep growing. A healthy five is always in pursuit of generosity. This is amazing. We don't know much about Nicodemus. He's only mentioned a couple of times. The first time is John chapter three, where he sneaks in to have a conversation with Jesus in the middle of the night. And he's trying to understand Jesus. The second time is in John seven, when they're trying to kill him. And Nicodemus observes that Jesus is not getting a fair trial. And he speaks up for Jesus. We don't know if he became a believer, but we know this, when Jesus Christ was crucified and his body was taken off the cross, the tomb was provided by a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, and the funeral expenses were paid for by Nicodemus. John 19, 39 through 40, with him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. I tried this week to figure out how on earth to calculate the value of the oils and myrrh that Nicodemus brought. I literally saw scholars argue anywhere between 50,000 American dollars and a half a million dollars. Nicodemus spent burying Jesus. Why? I believe eventually Jesus got from his head to his heart and he was transformed and he was generous to Jesus. Generous. Some of you look at that, you're like, I can go buy some aloe at CVS. (laughs) Okay, think more essential oils, guys, right? Think about how many thousands of dollars that is for an ounce. 75 pounds at a time when oils were far more precious than they are today. Literally, one scholar said, the cost may have been in the millions to bury a dead guy. Why? Because Jesus got from his head to his heart and he transformed his life. And he became generous with his time. On the eve of Passover, where is Nicodemus? burying Jesus. With his emotions, he expresses grief with Joseph of Arimathea on the eve of Passover. With his knowledge, he knows what to do. He knows, wait for it, how a king should be buried. Jesus is buried as a king. 75 pounds of rare oil which makes the resurrection all that more amazing. Next, he was generous with his money, right? He paid for it. He paid for it. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. So here's how the five needs to be real. How do you need to be real with yourself if you're the observer? I need to get out of my head and in touch with my feelings. If you love a five, here's the question. I hear what you're saying. Tell me how that makes you feel. The five will give you the facts. Here's the budget. Here's where we're going. Here's our retirement. Here's my job. Here are the pros. Here are the cons. Here's what it says on Wikipedia. And that's great. How does that make you feel? and invite them to talk about how they feel and make it a safe place. The five needs to get out of their head and in touch with their feelings, with my feelings. Here's how the five needs to be real with others. I wanna encourage you to memorize this verse, and if you're a five, I'm sure you will. Proverbs 18.1, he who separates himself seeks his what? Own desire. Nowhere in the Bible does God call you to live for yourself. He calls you to die to yourself. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all, wait for it, observers, sound wisdom. You get dumber on your own, not smarter. Not smarter. And let me just say this. There is no correlation in sociology between IQ and morality. 
You know what they found? People are not better people when they're smarter. They're just better at convincing themselves that what they're doing isn't wrong. So if you've got a smart kid, it doesn't mean they're going to be good. It just means it's going to be hard to catch them doing wrong because they're smart. That was funnier than that. You can laugh at that later. My feelings are already hurt. It's okay. So what does this mean? If you're an observer, if you're a five, you don't want to be in a small group. There's dumb people in there. But they understand life in many ways better than you do. And they can draw out things that you'll miss because you will never be who God's called you to be by yourself with your Bible in your backyard. And let me, let me say this, fives. You cannot worship a God who is community on your own. The prayer of Jesus is not that you would be one with him by yourself. The prayer of Jesus is that we would be one as God is one. That's the prayer. So you've got to press into community. You've got to press into relationship. You've got to make yourself available for date night, for talking, for relationships, literally for conversation, even if it's exhausting and everyone is stupid. Press in. Next, with God. This verse is kind of trippy. It's actually in reference to women, and most fives are men, but not all. But it says this, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. You can know everything there is in the Bible and know nothing about God. And how do we know that? Because Jesus stood before Pharisees and he said, you think that the Bible leads to salvation when everything in it is about me and you missed it. You need to learn, listen to me, if you're a five, connect with God in worship. I get it, it's scary. The song's kind of mushy. It's a little emotional. It's fine, embrace it. Connect with God with your heart. Connect with God with your emotions. Not every song and not every sermon needs to be dissected. Sometimes you just need to feel what God has to say. So how do you love a five? This is probably the most important thing. You gotta acknowledge their need for personal space and time. It's not that they hate you, it's just that they love time with themselves. I got a friend of mine, he's a five man. He's gotta deal with his wife, literally. He gets in his Jeep, drives out to the desert by himself. I could do that for about 45 seconds. I literally would go insane. I would go insane. I'm not going to the desert by myself. I'm not doing that. Five men, they're like, well, that sounds great. I never thought of that. I'll get a Jeep. I'll get a Jeep this week. I used to have a friend named Jack. Literally, he got two weeks vacation a year. Two weeks. This is back in the 50s. One week he spent with his kids. One week a year he spent by himself. I was like, my wife would kill me. But he did it. But it was the 50s. All right. Acknowledge their need for personal space and time. If you have a kid that's a five, they're gonna need their, their own time, especially if they share a room. You gotta give them their own time and their own space. Here's what you need to do. Express how much it means to you when they engage. Don't do this Well, it's about time. Oh, look at who smarty pants decided to join us for fun and family night. You just embarrass them, you just shame them, guess what they're gonna do, they're not coming back. Encourage them when they do engage. Tell them how much it means. They're smart, they'll figure it out, right? Thank you so much for joining us. It means so much when you come. I know groups exhaust you. I know parties wear you out. It means so much that you're here. Thank you, thank you. And let me say this. If you're married to a five, don't throw big parties. Have parties with smaller groups because fives come alive the smaller the group. If you got a 1,000 people, the five's over in the corner going, when is this over? Look at all these incompetent people. <laughs> Number three, do not criticize how they have fun. It's hard to tell, <laughs> but it is happening. My good friend Tom is a five. This is what he told me. When I buy a new car, 
I sit in the car and I read the entire owner's manual from front to back. <laughs> Let me just tell you, you can buy any car I have ever purchased. I cannot guarantee you the condition of the car. I can guarantee the condition of the owner's manual. It has never been opened. It is precisely the way it was the moment I bought the car. Because call me crazy when I buy a new car. I want to drive it. That's what he said. I love sitting in my new car and reading every page of all this amazing information. There are things in my car that I will never know what it does. You can add, what's that button doing? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not kidding you. I, I don't know. I got letters like 18 buttons in my car. I don't know. Don't press it. We might die. I don't, I don't know. I got a new car, it makes sounds. My kids are like, what's that mean? I don't know. I don't know. So don't criticize the way they have fun. Man, they like to geek out. They wanna, okay, if, if you're gonna go on a vacation, a five is gonna wanna know every single thing about every town, the history of that town, who died, who got killed, who got married there, what happened, and you're just like, I just wanted to go to the pier. <laughs> but they're, they're gonna geek out on that stuff. Oh my gosh, this post is a thousand years old. It was first constructed by, dang. I thought it was just a peer. So don't criticize how they have fun. They're just different, it's fine. They're smart, thank God people like doing that. Next, utilize their knowledge and wisdom. If you're dumb, the greatest gift you could give to yourself is figuring that out. <laughs> and become friends with a five. How's that work? I don't know, he knows. Where are you going? I don't know, but he's planning an amazing vacation. It's gonna be fantastic. There's gonna be old stuff there. <laughs> what airline are you going through? I don't know, he's picking. He's got a graph and a chart and a computer program at his home to find the cheapest flight on earth. It's pretty good, right? They're awesome. They're awesome. And if you're like me and you talk a lot, they're great friends because they have room for the air that comes out of your mouth. <laughs> Do you know what exhausts me? Someone like me. Look, this guy's like me. This is not happening anymore. Where's a five? I need a five. It's great. Because if you want a five to talk, you have to be very specific. I need you to speak now. I have a question, and it is not, you know, right, you get it, okay. They're awesome, they're amazing, they're incredible, incredible people, they're brilliant. And you need them in your small group, because, you know, when they're super quiet in your small group, what it means is you guys just started a cult, and you need to ask them, <laughs> have we gone off the rails theologically? Right. They're like, yes, eight weeks ago. I've been crafting a letter to the church. <laughs> All right, how to pray for the five. Listen, I wanna challenge you fives to pray this this week. God, help me to connect my heart to yours. Help me to feel more deeply and to embrace the mystery of who you are. You're never going to be able to fully understand God. Help me to have grace for people who are incompetent and change my heart on community groups, <laughs> right? Yes, that's what you need to do. Here we go, I'm in community group. Listen, we need you fives, we need you. God has given you a beautiful mind, but you have to share it with us, otherwise we don't get to be blessed by it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just today, Lord, and the awesome, incredible gift of the observer. We're so thankful, Lord, for the way they see the world, for the way that they operate, and the way they can help us connect with you intellectually, and they can draw out in us thoughts that we never knew we even had. So, Lord, bless us. We encourage the fives to join with us in community and to participate in the chaos of relationship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.